we are in part three, uh, episode three of our series Heroes. It's all about the book of Acts. If you don't know Acts, if you've missed the rest of this series, Acts is a sequel to the Gospel of Luke, written by the same guy, one of the great historians of the ancient world. It charts about the first 30 years of the early church as it grew and became a movement that changed the world. Now, when we started off the first week, we talked about this uh, concept of a bad translation. You know, when you see an embarrassing, uh, ridiculous translation of something that makes no sense. And church is a bad translation. The word church is actually a bad translation of the Greek word ekklesia. So Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. The, the word church is static, it's stationary, it's status quo. It's about a building, it's about institution, it's organized religion. But the word ecclesia, a better translation is the word movement. Jesus said, I'll start a movement, a gathering of people around a purpose, something that is all about people, something that is dynamic. And we see the early church as a movement of Jesus Followers. They weren't called Christians in those days, they were called followers of the way. Because it was a way that was changing life, changing societies, challenging the political norms, challenging cultural, societal norms, radically revolutionising the world in which they lived. And it was a movement that moved. And the way that they moved is that they did what Jesus talked about. And they talked about what Jesus did. So these early believers, they went out and what Jesus had talked about, they put into practice. So last week with our offering, that's another another example of the church doing when Jesus says, give, sell your possessions, don't worry about yourself, don't live for yourself, give to the poor, be generous, be in community. Well, they did that and that's why we do what we do. With the offering, and if you missed the the beginning, we we said our our total is 20,000. Uh, which means that not only can we do our goals for next year, we can do them for the next five years. Uh, if you miss that offering and you want to give, then you can. There's offering uh, things at the front. But not only did they do what Jesus talked about, but they talked about what Jesus did. If you just do what Jesus talks about, you'll be a nice club. You'll be self-contained and happy. And there was this kind of standoff between the political powers of the day that didn't like the church, didn't like what they represented, didn't like what they were doing, they were happy to keep them self-contained. They said, you can do all the things that you want to do. You can meet, you can worship, you can pray, you can give, you can sing, you can dance. Just don't want you to talk about Jesus. We just don't want to share your faith. And nothing changes down the centuries. We now live in a culture where people are broadly speaking happy for Christians to do what they want to do as long as it stays within the four walls of a church. Bad translation. In this building, this static status quo. But the minute you start sharing your faith, that's when you come into difficulties, problems and opposition. And the early church, they said, well, well, we, we cannot help but talk about what Jesus did. And when we talk about what Jesus did, the movement moves. But they have tremendous opposition. It comes in the form of cultural opposition, of political opposition and military opposition. Now the culture was, you had one and a half thousand years of Judaism, where every single person within that culture was brought up for generation upon generation. There is only one God. God does not become a human being like Caesar. That is, um, that, that's heresy and that is blasphemy. And then so you had the Pharisees who were the cultural religious heroes that maintained the cultural religious ideology. But then you had the political rulers. And a bit like the Pope in the Dark Ages, the high priest in Jesus' time was a purely political position. So it was the rich people that had parlayed themselves into power. They cut a deal. They were the liberals. They were the elite. They didn't particularly have faith. Most of them were a sect called the Sadducees. Sadducees didn't believe in any kind of resurrection from the dead. They didn't believe anyone rose from the dead. Once you die, you die. That's it. And that's why they were sad, you see. Bible joke. So the Sadducees had that kind of, thank you. Uh, They had that kind of mentality, but they were the political powers. And Rome with the empire was the military power. And that kind of comes into play later in the book of Acts as the church spreads and gets onto the radar of the Roman Empire. But really the cultural and the political, that those opposition, opposition forces, they haven't really aligned. So the Pharisees were in one camp, the Sadducees were in another. The Pharisees had the kind of the, the cultural, uh, liberal, uh, 
believe them, not the liberal, they were the opposite. They were the conservative, right-wing, hardliners. The Sadducees, they were the liberals, they were the compromisers, they were the kind of the political maneuvers. And they hadn't really come together. And so what the, the opposition did, they basically said to the, the apostles, don't speak about Jesus. But the apostles continued to speak about Jesus. And so the Sadducees find themselves kind of in a sense of... Um, they're just not able to do something. So they're apathetic and they've been outmaneuvered and they have no real kind of leverage to stop these people doing what they are doing until one person comes along. And one person is able to unite the cultural opposition with the political opposition. One person is able to come from the Pharisees, and you've heard about the Pharisees, and he comes as a Pharisee, he's a hardliner, he is right-wing, he's ultra-orthodox, he's hyper-conservative, hyper-nationalistic, religious Pharisee. And he comes and he begins to work with the political leaders who have the actual political and um, the, the kind of the police might behind them. And this man is called Paul. And so Paul is our subject today. And if you want to flash back to my baby cartoon Bible, this is Paul in his kind of most famous pose when he appears in the pages of church. You see him struck down from his horse. He sees a blinding light. So if you've ever heard the expression, I saw the light, this is where the law comes from. This is the guy that coins the expression, seeing the light. But before we see Paul become anything to do with the church, he is the enemy of the church. By the way, if you think that's a little bit kind of babyish, let me really encourage you to read Acts. When I read Acts as a kid in the cartoon Bible, it blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like it. I was just utterly gripped. But when I read it in the proper version of the Bible, the actual words of the Bible, I was even more gripped. And uh, I'd just like to recommend to you, here's a book, it's a series of books all on the New Testament called Acts for Everyone, or Mark for Everyone, or the Epistles for Everyone, the Prison Letters for Everyone. And this goes through, what it does is it reads through the Bible a bit at a time, and then it talks about the Bible passage, and it gives you insight so you can understand it. I use these things all the time, and I have used them for years. I've got the whole set of the New Testament. And uh, if you are any interested in uh, finding out more and developing your own faith, then read the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts, but read it with this. This is part one, there's a part two as well. In fact, I tell you what, I will give this book to the first person that wants it, and I'll buy myself a new book. So, who wants it? Okay, I will give it to Billy. Okay, so that's Billy. Billy's got Acts, he's on it, he's going to study it. And then the deal is, once you've read it, you pass it on to someone else. But it's fascinating reading about Paul, because he, he comes, and he comes in a kind of unusual way. So we have Barnabas, and we have his kind of hero introduction. Now we have Paul, and his hero introduction is dark. It's dark, dark, dark. The whole church thing goes to a different level. It's precipitated by this incredible young man, this bright fiery spark. And he's not one of the original disciples. He's a man named Stephen, a young man, a Jewish man, an educated, powerful speaker, a, a kind of person that everyone looks at and thinks, that's a great guy. That's a fantastic guy. We want him to be our intern. We want him to be on our team. And so Stephen comes along and he's brought on to help the social action program of the church. And he gets into this thing where he starts preaching about Jesus. And the first time, now no longer is it you're tolerated or maybe you're given a few lashes and put in prison for the night. Now it's mob rule. He talks about Jesus and it gets so intense that uh, people start criticizing him, heckling him. And as he's heckled, they start to pick up stones to stone him. And he has a vision of Jesus. He sees Jesus in front of him. And he lets them know, I can see Jesus. He's standing at the right hand of God. The crowd goes crazy. Now, in those days, they were not allowed to do this. This was highly, highly, highly illegal. If they were able to do this, they would have done it for Jesus. But now, somehow, Jesus has been crucified legally, kind of quasi-legally. But now you get this breakdown of law and order as mob rule because the church is so radically controversial. And it says this in Acts. 
At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, Stephen, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul, who would later become known as Paul, Saul is there as a kind of passive observer. We know that Saul was the rising star of the Pharisee sect. We know that he was discipled and mentored by one of the leading Pharisees who actually appears in the book of Acts, a guy called Gamaliel. Gamaliel was kind of, uh, he was a little bit of a soft, wise man advocating a soft line rather than a hard line. He basically said, don't Don't try and forcefully stop the church because it will peter out on its own. And that was his line and that was the line that they took. And Saul seems to be kind of going with that line. People, this mob rule, are starting to stone this guy. And this religious guy is not stopping them, but he's letting people uh, just put their coats. Hey, while you're stoning them, uh, leave your coats with me. I'll, I'll make sure that no one steals them. And that uh, your, your purse is in there, your wallet, your money. I, I'm a responsible person. I'm a man of God. I will keep care of your coats. And when we see Saul, he's kind of passive, observing, on the outside, but kind of okay with it all. He's not active. He's not the one stoning. He's kind of saying, well, I'm not going to stone, but I'll hold the coats. And then something happens. Something happens and it totally changes Saul. It has such a profound impact on him. It's almost like he has a personality flip. Suddenly something very profound comes over Saul and it's what he witnesses. He's an eyewitness. And you remember that actually this is Paul, later in life, dictating these things to his friend Luke, who became part of his team. So this is an eyewitness account of Saul, Paul himself. It says this, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Which is odd, because normally there's, there's all kinds of accounts in Jewish history of people being martyred and pronouncing judgment and uh, come up with on the people that were stoning him. You stoned me, but I curse you, and one day your house will come crashing down to the ground. Mark my words, you know, dying breath kind of stuff. But instead, Stephen just says, Lord, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, just like Jesus on the cross, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The Bible writer says he fell asleep because they believed in the resurrection. They knew death wasn't the end. And Saul is expecting, you know, this righteous execution which he approves of, he's expecting to do what everybody does. Curse upon your house. A curse upon you. But instead, Stephen echoes the words of Jesus. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then blow to the head and he's gone. And something about that scene flips a switch in Saul. It's like he goes from passive observer to now actively, vehemently, furiously, ferociously hunting down the church. It says this, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. In other words, this passive observer, this guy that's saying, well, you know, I'm not going to stand about, you know, I'll, I'll just look after the coast. The kind of measured response. Suddenly, he is breathing out anger, fury. He's trying to destroy the church. The ruling political powers try to contain the church. Saul tries to destroy the church. Do you ever have an experience where people, and this is for you if you're a Christian, but people that you know when you share your faith, suddenly, some of you here, you've become Christians, and people that you've had a very positive, polite, nice, normal relationship with, maybe for years, suddenly they become super aggressive, super hard. Suddenly you get criticized on all fronts, or maybe it comes from your family. You know, you start sharing, and you, you, you get baptized, or you share your story, and sometimes people who have been on your side, fighting your corner, suddenly everything changes. And that's what happened with Saul. It's almost like he knows he's wrong. It's almost like he's so provoked. And that's what the Christian movement does. 
When we are radical, when we follow in Jesus' footsteps, it's so provoking for people and sometimes it makes them go kind of crazy because you think, I don't believe in this, it can't be true, I can't understand this, I want to react against it. There's pure rage, pure fury, a kind of elemental opposition. And so something is triggered within Saul. He, he can't explain what he sees, but he just knows that it can't be right. It can't be right. It, it cannot be right. You, you can't have God becoming a man. This is not how it, it works. It, it, it can't be right. You can't have the Messiah crucified. Why are they saying he's risen from the dead? You can't have the resurrection. Everyone rises at the last day all at the same time. Can't be right. Can't be right. I've lived my whole life. I, I can't explain I must stamp it out. Must you destroy the church? But did you notice the most powerful three words in this passage? Something that staggers if you understand the cultural concept. It says this He dragged off both men and women. Both men and women. Now, Acts of this over and over and over again. Why is it important? Because it says this In a culture where women were deeply abused, repressed, held down, counted as property, not first class citizens, second class citizens, able to be bought and sold. Now the church is radical. Now the church has men and women that are making it happen. How do you stop me? How do you destroy me? I tell you how you do it. You cut off their head. You imprison the leaders. You take off the people that are influential. You get them out of the picture and then the flock scatters. They can't maintain themselves. And Paul makes a point of saying this. He had to take not just the men, because the men go, and then our church carries on, because the women are leading it, because Jesus releases all. See, I have to arrest the women as well. That's ridiculous. The women are leading within the church. And this is one of those things that's actually repeated three times in Acts, both men and women, both men and women. It starts off with Joel's prophecy, even before that. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on both men and women, sons and daughters will prophesy. And next week, we're going to do Priscilla. Kate's going to be talking about Priscilla because she epitomizes the early church leadership. So much so that when people talked about her with her husband, they put her name first, Priscilla and Aquila. How she had within the church uh, a greater level of leadership and influence than the man in her life, even if culturally it was the other way Round. And so it's both men and women. And then it goes on two chapters later, after um, the whole thing with Philip and Samaria. It says this Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. So now the political powers, they're like, This is great. We now have a radical, hard line ultra-right, ultra-orthodox, hyper-nationalistic guy on our team to do our dirty work. We're not really supposed to do this, and we were happy to contain it, but we were kind of, we were sort of gridlocked with them. Now we've got a guy who is just off the charts. He's going for it. So yeah, let him go. Not just to Jerusalem, not just to Judea, not just to Samaria, to Jolly Syria, to the neighboring country, to Damascus, 150 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So he got letters so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. (coughs) It goes on. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Now, later on in Acts, this story is repeated three times and we get a bit more detail. So filling in the detail, this was actually taking place at midday, the noonday sun. So a light brighter than the noonday sun. When it just comes out and, and literally he sees Jesus in this blinding light. He sees Jesus. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Now, this is incredible. In a moment, I'm going to reveal to you the two best words in all of Acts. The two best words in all of Acts. These are them, but they are kind of similar in many ways. But what comes next is unbelievable. What comes next? Listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus here, if you don't know God for yourself, if you've been disconnected and disengaged from church, you need to know this is what it's all about. This is why you should be running, not walking, into the arms of Jesus to give your life to Him. Because Jesus speaks to the man that is destroying the church. 
Jesus speaks to the man, who we find out later, has actually cast his vote and had people executed, murdered, imprisoned. This is a man who's done bad, bad, bad things to both men and women. What is God going to say to him? Do you ever feel guilty before God? Do you ever feel like, what happens if I stand before my maker? What happens if I stand before Jesus? I know my sin. I know my guilt. I know the things that no one else knows. And he knows. What would he say to me? Well, look, what does he say to the worst man ever in the history of the church up to that point? What does he say to the guy that is single-handedly destroying his church, that is committing atrocities against people? What does Jesus say to him? It says two words, Saul, Saul. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You, you don't seem amazed. <laughs> Maybe you don't understand how things work in the Bible. When you say someone's name twice in that culture, it is intimate. It is loving. It is very, very. It draws you in. It holds you close. When Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, Matt Moriah, and God sees his heart and sees that he's willing to give everything, I'm all in. And God says, Abraham, Abraham. When God speaks to Moses in the burning bush, and he presents himself as the I am God who will deliver his people. When Moses is upset and confused, and God speaks from the bush and says, Moses, Moses. When Jesus comes along and he has one of his favorite people in all the world and she's upset and she's confused, he's in her house and she's trying to get things right and red, white and ready, he says to her, Martha, Martha. It's his thing, because he's like his dad. It's like his dad who speaks out at the fire. And when Jesus gets passionate about his city, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to hold you to my chest, but you wouldn't have it. And when Simon Peter is going through difficult times, he says, Simon, 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 Simon. Satan's sort of sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. You're going to go through some hard times, Simon, Simon. When he's on the cross, he cries out, My God, my God. And now, the persecutor, the imprisoner, the murderer. He says, Saul, Saul. Such love, such kindness, such grace. Do you know what God says to you? When you come to Him in your brokenness, your rebellion, your guilt, your shame, your filth, He says, Emily, Emily. Kate, Kate. Billy, Billy. Matt, Matt. He says your name with such intimacy, with such longing. And the voice from heaven doesn't come out. You unbeliever, you son of a God. It doesn't come with condemnation. It is the voice of Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you know love, grace, and compassion. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he's saying, when you touch my people, you touch me. And Saul's like, who are you, Lord? Who are you? Who, what's going on? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And in that moment, Saul is down on the ground. He's like, no, 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 no. Jesus He is undone. He is horrified. He is utterly, utterly broken and beside himself because he loves God. And he's seen a man who claims to have a vision of Jesus glorified at God's right hand. And he stoned him. And all of his friends and family and fellow members, he put them in prison. And he's gone all through Jerusalem and all through Israel he's run out of people there and he's now going to foreign countries he's rounding them up as they are running shrieking away from him and Jesus is it's all true 
And he sees the very same thing that Stephen sees. My God, my Lord, Jesus. He is horrified and he is caught in awe and wonder because he sees the risen Lord Jesus. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The man, men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, that's Saul's story. In a conversion of Saul, you can read it in Acts chapter 9. We're looking at it now, but you can go ahead and read it in your own time. You'll actually discover a really interesting thing. That in Saul's conversion, Saul isn't the main character. About two times the amount of Bible text is dedicated to, not Saul, but another guy, a Christian named Ananias. And it's the Bible's way of saying, when someone comes to faith, actually the person, the Christian... They may not be significant, they may be normal and ordinary, but that is the key person in other people finding faith. So, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, just a regular disciple, you've never heard of him before, you've never heard of him again. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, love all this historical background. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, and that's kind of weird, because Ananias is having a vision, and in the vision God's telling him, someone else is having a vision um, of him. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, Ananias, at this point, he does what you do when you want to pray and when you want to talk to God. He does the thing of telling God what's going on. So if you've ever been in a bad position and you feel like you're, you're called to share Jesus in your workplace. You say, but God, you don't know my workplace. You don't know that they're actually quite hard. They're actually quite mean. My line manager is a real... And you you tell God all these things. And that's what Ananias does. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. In other words, Ananias is saying, hey, by the way, just news flash for you, God. You probably haven't caught up with this. But Saul is a seriously bad guy. You know, really, you, you should be informed. He's done some pretty on-the-edge bad things. He's come here with authority from the chief priest. Because I have no idea, really. <laughs> to arrest all who call on your name. How many times have you said to God all these things? Like you're telling him as if he's never heard this before. Like you're telling him your problems, you're telling him your difficulties, you're telling him your issues. And maybe God speaks to you about sharing faith in your flat, or God speaks to you about you know, some of the challenges that he gives you as a Christian, and you start telling him all the reasons, and then you pray, oh Lord God, help me in this, help me in that, because this is, and then you tell God all these stuff, and then you just finish the prayer, amen. Well, the thing about Ananias is it does all those things, but he doesn't finish prayer. He continues to listen. So next time you come before God and you have an issue and you're having struggles with it, don't just tell God what he already knows. Tell him and then ask him to speak to you and give you some direction. And Ananias gives space to God and God gives him direction. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. At which point, the whole thing changes. Ananias literally falls off his chair and starts laughing uncontrollably in his living room. He's like, seriously? What? God, this is the best thing ever. You're going to take the hardline, ultra Orthodox, far right, hyper nationalistic Jewish Pharisee, and you're going to send him to the Gentiles. That's the funniest thing I have ever heard. You're going to take a Pharisee. Of all the things we read in the Gospels about Jesus and the Pharisees, and he's coming against the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are trying, you're going to use a Pharisee. And even to go out of Jerusalem, out of Judea, out of the Jewish culture, to the Gentiles, that is just the finest thing. 
And God's like, yeah, I, I know, insane. And Ananias says, this is just unbelievable. And God says, yeah, and it's going to cost him. Because he's going to take the gospel all over the world. And he's going to be beaten. He's going to be shipwrecked. He's going to be stoned. He's going to be hungry. He's going to be thirsty. He's going to be misunderstood. There'll be murder plots. There'll be people who want to kill him day in and day out. He's going to be without money. He's going to be without reputation. He is going to be killed for all of this. And at this point, Ananias says, All right, I'm in. I mean, probably die. But it's hilarious. And if this is you, God, then it is amazing. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, And these two words really are the best, best, best words in the whole book. The whole of Acts, 28 chapters, these are the next two words. Some of you already know it, some of you don't. But these, I promise you, these are the two best words in the book of Acts. He says this. Brother Saul. I can't even say it without crying. Because it's like, it's like his father again. These Jesus people are amazing. When Jesus says, Saul, Saul, Ananias says, Brother Saul, you have terrorized my friend. You have imprisoned the people I love. You have blood on your hands. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't sort of fold his arms and say, okay, well, you've got to speak for yourself, rude boy. He just stands in front of him and he says, brother, brother Saul. Do you know when we were on the weekend away and I got all emotional about that? And I told the story about the prodigal son. And the prodigal son comes home to the father because the father loves the son so much and wanted him to do nothing more but to come back home. And the older brother in the field, you won't come into the party. God's throwing a party. And the older brother says, I'm not coming into the party. That guy's a waiter. He's, he, how dare you bring him in? And, and, and the father says, he was lost. He's found. He was dead. He's alive again. And, and the brother says, this son of yours, you've wasted all your money on prostitutes, on whores, on wild living. And the father says, this brother of yours was lost. And he won't come in. And we talked about how God's throwing this party for people. And the church very often is just like the older brother. Well, Ananias isn't like the older brother. Ananias is exactly what you want. Ananias makes Jesus reframe his story. Jesus has to go back and retell the parable of the prodigal son. Because Ananias just made it better for everybody. He says, brother, brother Saul. When you pray for your friend that's not a believer, they're your brother, they're your sister. Even before they've come to faith, even before they've come to the church, they're God's children, brother and sister. He says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who has appeared to you on the road as you are coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Ananias just welcomes him in as a brother. You have people that you know that God is working in. Even some of those people who've been mega hard and awful and horrible to you, they're doing something because something is being provoked. And if you would be like Ananias, you'd say, this person is my sister, this person is my brother, I will pray for them, I will pray for them, I will pray for them, I will pray for them. Ananias is when he puts everything on the line. He prays, and that is how the church moves. I want a church of Ananiases. If we had metro full of Ananiases, then we could change this city to sweet. We could see God do amazing things through us because we would be a bunch of people that don't hold the world at arm's length and stay inside the state of our four walls. We would be reaching out and praying and sharing and praying and sharing and praying and serving and praying and loving. And our arms would be open, brother Saul, brother Saul, brother Saul. We'd be bringing in the men and we'd be bringing in the women. And so there's one more thing to add to our equation. These early believers, they didn't just do what Jesus talked about. And they didn't just talk about what Jesus did. They gate-crashed God's party. 
See, the book of Acts isn't about a bunch of people just carrying on where Jesus left off. It's about a bunch of people continuing to follow where Jesus is leading. But now Jesus is leading by the Holy Spirit. They see what God is doing. Now, when we talked about reaching our city for Jesus, when we talked about reversing those trends and changing that narrative, it won't happen just by us doing our best and doing our hardest. That is great. But actually, it will happen because God is with us. Amen? God is with us. God is doing something in our city. Mark my words. Mark my words. We're going to see some stuff in this city that will make your eyeballs swivel, will make your heart beat race, that will make your hair stand on end. God is throwing a party and we're all invited to gate crash it. And God is the one that brings Saul to his knees, shines a light, reveals himself to him, and then says, Ananias, you come, you finish it off. Like when I was a kid and my mom said, hey, Phil, come and bake a cake with me. And she does all the work. And then she whips up some icing and says, Come Phil, you stand on this stool and you take the spoon and you take the icing and you put it on the cake. And I'm putting the icing on the cake. And then she says, Now Philip, you can lick the spoon. And I lick the spoon. And I'm helping my mum bake a cake. That's how God is. He's throwing a party. He invites us to bake a cake. Actually, he bakes the cake. We just get to lick the spoon. Because he is the good, good father who's doing good things. Great news, good news for the poor. In this next phase, we are going to see some amazing things happen. We're going to see it, I'm telling you, so that when it happens in the next few months, in the next couple of years, you'll say, Philip, you called it. I absolutely did call it. God is doing some great things. And that's why Matt has given up the home office. And that's why Sam has given up what he's given up. And that's why Kate is giving up what she's giving up, all the career plans that she's got. We're all giving up. So that's why we put money into the offering and God's pow, look what I'm doing. Because God's going to be doing miraculous stuff, just like he did for the early believers. And we're going to be part of his movement, a movement that will change and transform our city. We're going to see it. And so we do what Jesus talks about, we talk about what Jesus did, and then we gate crash God's party. You see what God is doing with your friends, with your work on, with your flatmate, with your family, with your colleague. You see what God is doing, and then you get involved. So we're going to pray in just a second, but what I want you to do is this. I want you to think of someone. In fact, this is what we're going to do. I just want you to close your eyes right now. And I want you to pray this single sentence prayer with me. We're going to say, we're going to ask God to show us whose life he's working in. Because all around us there's souls that he wants to make into pause. So let's pray this prayer out loud after me. Dear Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, show me now whose life you're working in. Just keep your eyes closed and let God bring them to mind. in the quietness in your own private way I want you to make a commitment that you'll pray for them you'll pray every day and I'd like to encourage you to read the book of Acts to keep stirring you and inspiring you read the book of Acts get the Tom Wright books to go with it steal Billy's copy and when you read the Bible when you pray don't just tell God all the stuff that he knows, but wait and ask for him to show you what he's doing in people's lives and how you can gate crash that party. And when he gives you the option, the opening, the opportunity, you lay hands on the sick. You speak a word of God in a very non-religious, not for any way, to that person. You ask God to speak to you, and you gate crash God's party. Because it's through the supernatural, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we will do this work and the movement will move. So Father, I pray right now that you would help us, inspire us. Thank you for what you did with Saul. But Lord, I thank you even more for what you did with Ananias. 
I want to pray that we would be a church of Ananias, open-hearted, welcoming people in as brother or sister, risking everything to draw others in that you are moving in their lives. Lord, would you help us? Would you inspire us? Would you empower us? And I want to pray for those of us that are here and we, we feel more like Saul than Ananias. I want to pray that we would see you, Jesus. And the spiritual scales would fall from our eyes that we would see things clearly as they are. Would you do this in Jesus' name I pray.